Yes, just a quick introduction. So um, we are a very small firm. There's only um, two of us in LA, myself and Stephen Jerome, who's sitting there. And um, S Stephen has been uh, documenting all our work for over the past decade, and he's also the sounding board. And um, Xavier is based in Paris. So we, um, most of our work is done through Skype. That's how we connect. And um, just really quick about, um, I think this, this, um, this talk is more about the process, how we, uh, the way we see and how we make things. And it's, it's really an intuitive way how we look at things. There's not, almost, there's not much dialogue or meaning in the work, but the actual meaning comes from the work itself, the making part of it. And wherever we travel, we sort of um, draw on things that we've seen and experienced, and somehow that will reflect um, in our next work. And the work is co continually evolved. Um, The next few slides would be um, the things that um, some of the work that who's really have a strong influence in our work. Uh, often we, we, our approach is more like, uh, it's, it's really more of a landscape artist. We're not landscape architect per se, but um, it's, it's about creating an environment that's really um, about the mood, the atmosphere, and immersive environment, and really about the everyday material that we can get our hands on and evolve over time. And these are some of the work that, are, for example, Sarah Moon is, is really um, somehow when we stumble upon this work of uh, uh, Sarah Moon, it's really a wonderful inspiration because you look at it and you, you, you don't really know what you're looking at, but you keep looking. And, and there's something really mysterious about it. And one can create one's own dialogue or connecting to the photographs. And uh, some of the work is really um, interesting. When, uh, when it's a fashion uh, shoot, then you really see about the, um, the silhouette rather than the work itself, but it's highly recognizable. So if you look at it, you say, ah, that's Yamamoto, or that's from the Gasson, and it's, it's really interesting. Uh, we also heavily influenced by, um, we're really interested in what's going on in the world of fashion because we just really love the, that creative spirit of uh, trying new things and especially in landscape, it's not that easy to try new materials and in fashion, you have to constantly, in every collection, you have to try something new. And um, this one collection is the uh, Comme des Garçons the lump and bumps, uh, that's really one of my favorite. Uh, just, just for a reason that it changed how one look at the perception of beauty and the human form. And it's just sort of like uh, something that when I look at it, uh, both of you and I, we, we feel like we look at it and we see landscape. We see how can we translate that same spirit and create um, something new for us. And this one is Victor and Roth. Uh, the collection of Russian doll is really fascinating because we look at it with that, well, it, is it fashion, is it art, or is it both? Uh, it's a performance, and uh, it's just amazing to see this kind of Russian doll come to life, and that's just quite inspiring. And um, these are the things that we stumble upon. For example, if we um, go to the uh, mu museum or at the bookstore and uh, during the time that I was at GSD uh, two years ago, uh, I, I found, discovered this um, wonderful Polish uh, poet, Wisława Swimbowska. And um, it was almost like um, somebody was speak she was speaking directly to me. I mean, when I read something about conversation with a stone, and then when you read that, the feeling was like completely changed how one's look at stone as a material. And um, the same thing with um, Louis Glick, that um, completely, especially the, um, the white iris really changed our way of looking at plants. It's almost like you reverse the, the process. If the plants can speak, what would they say? If they have to have a voice, and uh, these are the things that constantly, things that we draw from. And for, for example, a film that is really 
sort of like bring back the, you can feel the magical realism in the film. And, and we, we look at it and we thought, if we can create a dream world, what would it be? Uh, how do you create this real environment? And um, the same thing with Pan's Labyrinth and the woman with our man. Uh, th these are the films that somehow, when we look in, when when we look at this movie or we watch this movie, we don't really think so much about the storyline, but it really the the mood, the atmosphere, and and, and just the whole dreamlike sequence, and it's just quite remarkable. And we thought, can we do something like that in landscape? And one of our favorite artists is Via Selmsman. Um, Partly because the work is just so labor intensive and you look at it and, and you just have to keep looking at it. There's no dialogue really, but it just draw you in. And when I actually saw this show at the Hammer Museum in LA, one can spend hours and hours and the more you look, the more it pull you in. What's so interesting is the subject matter we aren't familiar with. There's no explanation necessary, but uh, the more you look, the more it it's transformed, and the scale, it becomes something so big, even though the painting is so small, and um, quite remarkable. And this one last slide here, um, just in terms of inspiration, when we were in China, and um, with the slides on the, on the left, is uh, in Hangzhou, and we stumbled upon this wonderful old ancient vine. And it's something that so natural, but um, it's just like a living sculpture. And when we look at it, 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 it gives you a sense that something just happened. And it's just so spectacular, and it's just wonderful that people just have to walk around it. And you, we observe how people stop and look at it and marvel at this ancient vine. And the same thing um, on, on the image on the right in Mumbai when we were on a field trip to Mumbai two years ago. And you see this old building and how trees just grow on it. And sometimes we look at that and we just thought, it's not so much about design, but it's just like coincidence or something incidental, things just happen. And we, we, we thought if we can remove the, um, a little bit of the design process and rather than deliberate formal design, um, language to create something that is very spontaneous. It's like something that comes in our head and then we just um, make things with our hand. This one is my very first um, garden when I started out after school and uh, it was on the hill of Echo Park and it's a glass garden. Um, the whole thing was based on my memory of Vietnam. It's more like a allegorical uh, um, project where just these kind of hazy memories of Vietnam that uh, I left Vietnam when I was 13 and um, haven't been back for 20 years. So after that, it, it just, I, I wanted to look for a medium, one medium that can have this um, effect. And the one thing that uh, I was working with is a uh, recycled glass. So we were thinking of maybe Stephen helped me with this project and, it, and we were thinking of three months and it ended up with um, two and a half years to finish this one. And we start with one bucket of recycled glass and in, by the time we finish it, uh, we use up 45 tons. And the idea was um, to develop this, this material into glass pebbles. You, you uh, tumble it so that it's soft and, uh, and remove all the sharp edges so that you can actually walk on it. And, um, it's just a very small garden, but it's sort of um, coming from the front to the back. And when you turn around the corner, then you see the salt uh, field. So these are those glass cones in the water. And um, it, it wasn't so much about design, but it was just I wanted to create something, an environment that I, I look at it and it helped me define who I at, at that time I didn't know who I was. And, and this project really helped me to connect and the, the most wonderful thing that happened um, was to discover that it's about the mood. The garden constantly changes because of the glass reflected during the day. And um, it takes on different mood from daytime to nighttime and on the winter time. So 
that's when I really uh, ch changed my way of thinking about how to make a garden that is uh, mostly just based on memories. And there was no drawing for this one. It was just all uh, try and error and then um, just, just finding my way. And then after that, we, we submitted for the Chaumont Sulor Garden Festival and we were, was accepted. So we thought we can push this medium further with recycled glass, but this time combine it with another material, um, manila rope just to create this more like an outdoor theater. Um, and it's called Desert Sea. That was in uh, 2001. And that was when I met Xavier uh, at the Garden Festival. Xavier was a student there. And um, we, we just really connect because um, we share the same sensibility. And, and that's when we start to, uh, uh, the timing was just perfect. I, um, right before we left for France, I applied for the uh, Rome Prize at the American Academy in Rome. And um, was when I returned and I found out that I was uh, accepted, so I contacted Xavier and then we collaborated since, ever since. So Xavier came to Rome and worked with me for a year and together we really um, experienced just, just have that time for one year because without I think that was a turning point for me um, because I could have go and work for a firm or do something else, but somehow this really gave me the courage to just do my own thing. And the, the luxury of time that that whole year in Rome, it just sort of really gave us the time to experience the everyday life. I mean, a total immersion in Rome. Uh, simple thing like walking on cobblestone, and you can hear, if you, if you listen, you can really hear the footstep. And you, if you listen more closely, you can tell whether it's a man or woman, and so forth. And it's really high on the senses, I mean, at least for, for me. And the, we, <laughs> there were so many inspiration everywhere in Rome, but the one thing that really moved us the most is um, Benini's sculpture. Um, Apollo and Daphne is something that we just constantly revisit it and just walk around 360 degrees and see how the sculpture just come to life. And it's just remarkable. And the same thing with um, the blessed Ludovica. And of course the Caravaggio and, and so forth. And toward the end of our stay, we have to, we participated in the uh, annual exhibition, and this was one of our installations. So we got a little bit ambitious, and we sent over nine tons of glass to transform this courtyard and um, completely transform our studio. And um, in the photograph, you can see Adele Chaffield Taylor, who is a great inspiration for every one of us at the Academy. And um, this was the opening day. So it was a performance. Uh, slash installation, so we discovered this wonderful mime who was um, always in front, standing in front of the Piana, Nav Piazza Navona, and um, we invited her to the academy, and she became a living sculpture, just looked like rising out the fountain, and then we transformed the studio. Um, this took us about a month to, uh, to complete it. And we also collaborate with another um, Italian masseuse and another music composer. So this sort of like an assemblage of all the things that we learned and experienced in Rome and trying to put it in our own way of creating our own context, just sort of uh, apply to, um, just to see what happened if we bring the outdoor indoor and vice versa. And, um, create this environment that is, can be open to all the fellows and visitors for the whole month. Uh, after Rome, this was our very first installation, a temporary uh, public art installation in the city of Emeryville. And uh, for this one, we got the help from, uh, we worked with uh, architect William Massey for the uh, laser, stainless steel laser frame, and um, 
laser cut frame, and that is all wrapped with a fishing line. After three, after three years of working with recycled glass, then um, we became no more like the last guy, and that's one thing that we thought uh, it's, maybe it's time to explore other materials. Um, at the same time, we were, were invited to create this installation, temporary installation, to celebrate the uh, um, Mimosa Festival uh, at the Luxembourg Garden. And the challenge was um, we can choose any location and we asked if we could create something inside the Medici fountain. And the answer was yes, but the only um, one thing is we cannot get inside the pond, so inside the fountain, so everything must float. And in order to create this, we use this fresh mimosa and just suspend it by cables, I mean by fishing line. Now I'm gonna let Xavier, the next few projects will be um, the project that we did in France, and Xavier will, I think he'll be best to uh, share with you the, the process. So I will introduce uh, this, um, this project, which is uh, a bit more with greenery this time, um, which is based in, in Brittany. That's, <clears throat> that's where I come from. And this is more like a family garden. And um, so it's a very simple um, way of looking at um, uh, the architecture of, the, uh, of a garden with uh, just taking the... Um, uh, the elements from the surrounding landscapes and trying to just organize a garden in, in a very simple way um, by following the, the lines basically of, um, of uh, what's existing around. But what is important in Brittany is that um, the, um, the mood and the atmosphere change very quickly uh, because of the, um, the, the ocean that is not very far and uh, you, know, you have all these clouds and the light that keeps changing. So. The idea was to have um, also a garden that would uh, reflect that. And also with the planting, having some very sharp contrast uh, throughout the seasons, so that it would change uh, and give different texture and different colors. And then when you turn, when you look uh, the other way, then you have these um, um, landforms that um, evokes a little bit also the, the seascapes and the, the low tide um, seascapes. A few planting, plantings, very subtle, but it's very, yeah, very simple. Last year we were invited to, um, at the Potager du Roi, it's uh, more like the kitchen garden for, for the king um, in Versailles. That's also where the the, the landscape architecture school is based. I don't come from uh, Versailles, actually. So it was uh, quite a pleasure to be there. And um, so this is our uh, king, uh, Louis XIV, who I don't believe uh, was um, coming very often to the garden necessarily, but uh, for sure he's uh, watching his garden. And um, the, so the, the project is um, a project um, uh, f to talk about the pollens and the allergy to pollen, so it's, uh, it was a temporary installation. And um, so it needed, it needed to be something very quickly gr grown. So we thought about the, um, the wheat field by, uh, by Van Gogh and trying to, to have this uh, idea of um, lines um, that would um, be drawn on the ground. And it, it's also very much connected to the place itself, which is, um, well, uh, today it's still um, um, the savoir-faire, if I may say, of um, uh, the culture of fruits and vegetables. And, and it's very precise and very old, of course. And all this uh, tradition is carried on throughout the, throughout the, the generations. So that's what is interesting. So we thought that it would be interesting to to work a little bit on the uh, on the ground and, and and try to to do something instead of just doing a field, uh, do something a little bit more um, um, texturized and also um, sensual in a way. 
um, by reinterpreting a little bit um, this uh, handwork, which is uh, very tedious. So the idea was to draw all these lines and, and, and plant the seeds one after one uh, seed, all of that on 600 square meter, which is quite tedious. So there, there were, um, <coughs> yes. So we see on the background the, the, the potager. And so there was uh, those uh, three squares like this, and we, you can see the, the school, uh, which is a building uh, along those, um, those parterres, and uh, on the back, the, 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 the church that is um, quite a highlight in the city. And then when it was starting to, 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 um, when the, to germinate, um, you would see the, the texture and slowly it would disappear when, when it grows. So, and the idea was um, to evoke the pollen was to have these um, little um, um, glass balls um, that we custom made uh, in, um, um, in Bohemia and to install them in, uh, in very large quantity and then when you have the, mo um, the, the wind uh, picking up then you have uh, all of these little kind of well, pollen, but also kind of firefly look uh, that would keep moving in the wind. And it's something very, very simple, very ephemeral, but at the same time, uh, it has this kind of um, elusive and poetic um, touch. Just for the story, the, the church on the, on the background, it's, um, that's where um, uh, Louis XVI, uh, the last king, basically uh, uh, went to confess uh, uh, before being decapitated. <laughs> so, and to continue with this uh, uh, macabre uh, situation, um, I would continue with uh, this um, um, uh, religious uh, heritage that we have in uh, in France and. Uh, uh, also last year, it was um, we were invited to make two installations in Beauvais. It's uh, one hour and a half from Paris, on the northeast of Paris. And uh, two sites, two historic sites. Uh, the first one is um, the Maladrerie Saint Lazare, which is a leprosy, um, yeah, leprosarium. Um, so that's where all the lepros uh, would be staying. Um, and um, so that's um, uh, about two kilometers outside of the of the center of the of the town, and it's uh, a quite uh, beautiful site. Um, you have uh, um, this um, um, old church and uh, and the remnants of the. Um, uh, this is the um, cantina, or <laughs> what do you call it? <laughs> anyway. Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a quite large complex of, uh, of buildings and slowly they are starting to restore all of that and to bring people, they also, they are, they also want to, to create an art program to, to start to have uh, um, uh, people coming in. And this big building um, on, the, on the left is um, a barn which uh, still has uh, its original uh, wood structure. So that's all of these uh, buildings are from the 12th and 13th century. And the second site is in the center of the city of Beauvais. It's um, what we call a collegiate, which is um, the, the heart of, uh, of a church, or at least what is left. And uh, so there's still three walls and they built um, a roof, um, I mean a ceiling uh, to, to keep uh, all of these elements together. And you can still see also um, uh, at the front, uh, you see the, 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 the leftovers of, uh, of the Roman, Roman wall. It's a very old city. The minute you dig some, uh, in, in the city, you, you find something and the, the, the construction stops and it just goes forever. So it's, a, it's quite a challenge. Um, and next to that um, college gate, there is... Um, uh, the, the Cathedral of St. Peter, which is uh, quite a piece of architecture and in, uh, under renovation also. So we thought that we would 
connect to this um, religious uh, theme um, because um, sometimes when we just realize that we don't know, especially um, we don't we don't know so well um, the, the medieval times, and um, it uh, what I learned at least uh, is that um, uh, people were quite clean and they would uh, take a bath quite very often, uh, contrary to what w we would think, and um, so that's um, an image showing that. Um, uh, the bath, and uh, with, they would also use plants to um, to help um, uh, eliminate the disease. And uh, it was uh, it was really really famous um, at that time, and it became slowly public. Um, and then it was uh, also places of pleasure, and also a mythical. Uh, there is a whole myth behind it because. Um, uh, the fountain of youth, yes, it's just uh, this idea of um, um, becoming yeah, young again and, uh, and, and, and having this fresh um, energy back. Um, and coming back to the, to the collegiate, um, what we were thinking is that uh, basically we still have the frame of the, what used to be a stained glass and um, it used to be full of light, and the light was also something very symbolic. These projects, these two, these two installations are uh, quite highly symbolic in a way, which is not so much what we used to do, but it was appropriate for this. Um, and yes, all of this magic of the light is um, an inspiration for us for, for the installation that we proposed. Um, so the idea was to have these... Um, uh, strings of um, fishing line uh, holding a cupola of light. The idea would have would be to um, was to have um, um, a bath of um, of light um, and kind of a purification, if we say. And um, so that it was quite a challenge to to install actually and to find the right way to to do things because as Andy was saying, we uh, always. Uh, uh, try to to find uh, the most complicated things uh, more or less uh, to do, and sometimes it appears that it's a small, the 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 simplest uh, solution that is of course uh, the solution. So slowly we were able to uh, get out of this chaotic, um, uh, yeah, this chaos, uh, and uh, and slowly assemble the the cupola with the the, the crystal that were on hold uh, on. Um, loaned by Swarovski. <coughs> and then on the ground we used some, some clay and um, uh, just a few plants and that will eventually crack. And it would keep um, changing with the light, of course, and um, also the wind. The wind is uh, an important e uh, element for both installation because the whole cupola would, uh, um, it's um, rings, concentric concentric rings, so they would keep um, changing. And it, 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 it looks a little bit like a jellyfish, actually, when it moves in the wind. And then for the other side, which is a little bit more um, um, dramatic in a way, okay, we had the, the cupola um, on the first side, and now we reverse uh, this shape to, to create a bowl. But um, coming back to the inspiration of, uh, of that, it's, uh, okay, the, the leprous who used to live there uh, were basically banned from the society. They were... They would assist to their own funeral in a way, because um, uh, they would go to the church first, and um, basically the, the priest would say, "Okay, you, you're dead," and then uh, they would go to the maladrerie, to the leprosarium um, to live. So they they were given this um, uh, very highly fashionable um, costume and. Um, 
and um, this little instrument, I don't know the, the word in English, but um, to just to, to make sure that everybody knows when they're coming. Because they were, it's, it was not a prison. They were able to go out, but they were living from uh, charity, basically. And they, they, were, they were not able to, to be in contact with anyone. The, what is in, interesting here is also that they were not able to go in the bus with the other people because, it, um, as I was explaining earlier, um, the, the bus the bus bec became um, uh, public, and it was you know mixed and uh, um, so the lepers were um, using their own well, um, um, so they were not able to, to to share the same pleasure as the other ones. So back on the site, um, the installation is, um, well, we don't necessarily see here, but um, we have this, uh, this idea of a bowl, basically, which is made out, out of um, um, little um, glass balls, again. Um, all of them are on uh, different uh, size and uh, diameters of uh, rods. And the idea is to have a bath of blood. Yes, I didn't explain the, the idea behind the, the red ball, but it's, um, there, is, there was um, um, at least people were believing at that time that um, um, to cure from the leper, um, you would need to take a bath of blood, and ideally the blood from innocent people, which is kids. Um, so that's the idea behind it's to get to, to, to give an, an experience that is quite intense. So people were invited to to go um, to cross the the water basically, uh, and to go on the water and cross the bowl, um, and then um, yes, and on the water we would, we we. Um, installed some um, um, duckweed that would keep uh, spreading um, eventually. So the whole installation would uh, also move it with the wind, the sound produced by the, the rods um, uh, touching uh, each other. Um, well, it was quite dramatic in a way, yes. Um, coming back to Paris, we were um, um, invited to do an installation for Kenzo new headquarters in Paris. And um, we proposed this uh, cloud chandelier, which is uh, made out of uh, chicken wire and um, crystal, cut, cut crystals. And uh, that, that's um, the beginning of uh, a cloud series that Andy will um, um, tell you all about um, a little bit later. And um, what inspired us in this uh, project is um, the concept of the wabi-zabi. And uh, it's a, basically the beauty of uh, imperfection, the impermanence. And um, um, we explore that well for the context, in the context of Kenzo and the Japanese um, uh, aesthetic, it was a perfect uh, moment to do that. And um, yes, and he will talk more about it. So, and um, well, to come back to this, to this, uh, to this one, actually, it was um, um, the challenge in this. Um, uh, protected courtyard. It, you, it was we couldn't touch um, the walls or anything basically, so everything has to stand by itself. And um, originally we wanted we, we wanted to make a cloud and have it float in the courtyard, but then it was impossible. So we had to to imagine something, and it became like a cloud tree somehow with this um, uh, stylized uh, trunk. And that's when also we started to think of trees, and um, we then um, created um, our first tree in uh, at the Tuileries Garden, um, which is uh, in the axis with the Louvre Museum. And it was uh, a project sponsored by the Champagne House Laurent Perrier. 
It's um, right in front of the, the Orangerie Museum. For those who, who, who have been there, there are absolutely amazing um, uh, paintings by Monet. Um, it's two rooms um, fill up 360 60 degrees um, with um, Monet painting. It's also the Museum of Impress Impressionists. So there are a few uh, pointillistic um, uh, paintings, not necessarily this, that one, but um, there are some uh, Georges Seurat also inside. So we took all of these uh, parameters and, and existing context um, to imagine uh, a tree that is um, made out of made of um, steel and um, twenty thousand leaves of uh, mother of pearl, golden mother of pearl. And what is interesting also is that um, you have the sound and the light that keeps uh, um, transforming and giving different. Um, um, ambience and atmosphere also um, to this garden. And on the ground uh, we grew some, um, some grass and perennial plants and this was only for a few days uh, event uh, for the, what, what they call Jardin Jardin which is uh, um, a garden fair more or less um, uh, at the Tuileries. And lastly uh, I will show you just um, a quick uh, presentation of that cloud so that you understand the, the, the importance of the, of the material. Uh, and what they do. Passion, toujours avec deux fous d'innovation, de création, plasticien du paysage, comme ils aiment à se nommer, on les suit dans leur univers extraordinaire. Du 5 au 7 juin dernier a eu lieu au Jardin des Tuileries la sixième édition de Jardin Jardin. L'occasion de rencontrer le duo de plasticiens du paysage, Cao Perrault, deux jeunes gens de moins de 30 ans, pétris de talents qui ont une approche très nouvelle de la notion de jardin. Pour cette édition, une grande maison de champagne leur a passé commande d'une création. Ils ont eu carte blanche. On a pu tester plusieurs de leurs champagnes. Et nous, on a choisi de, de prendre euh, bon, leur, euh, leur champagne prestige pour euh, euh, le décliner dans l'installation. On a créé ce, cette structure voilà, très très légère, très, euh, très filaire. On a choisi donc vraiment d'aller au maximum dans la légèreté, qui est l'une des particularités du, du champagne. un petit peu notre travail, c'est de, de se dire euh, bon, on est euh, aux Tuileries, on est près du musée de l'Orangerie, comment, comment pouvoir s'inspirer de, de ce lieu Ce qu'on a voulu faire, c'est euh, un petit clin d'œil un petit peu euh, impressionniste euh, dans, dans la catégorie euh, pointillisme. Voilà. Chaque petite branche en fait, que, que l'on voit sur, sur cette installation est créée à la main et puis donc après il y a tout un travail euh, sur le fer, de, de, de façonnage. Et ce bruit c'est comme une musique, c'est très mélodieux. Pour nous c'était très important d'utiliser euh, cette, euh, bon, cette matière bon, d'une part pour sa couleur parce qu'elle euh, évoque très bien le, le champagne mais surtout euh, ses propriétés euh, très euh, réfléchissantes, miroitantes, euh, iridescentes. Ce qu'on a voulu évoquer à travers ces, ces, ces feuilles de nacre également, c'est le, le fait que, voilà, que, que ça brille, que ça pétille, qu'il y a un, toute une vie en fait, là-dedans. La nature est belle, c'est ce que nous avons voulu transcrire avec cet objet dans cet environnement. La couleur et la texture de la nacre assemblées ainsi donnent à voir beaucoup de joie. Sous le ciel dégagé, l'arbre aux mille feuilles de nacre Caopero scintille au soleil, entraînant les visiteurs dans un univers un peu magique. Andy Cao et Xavier Perrault ont réalisé une grande sculpture extrêmement légère avec ses pampilles de nacre qui sont posées sur euh, une sorte de jardin euh, suspendu à quelques centimètres du sol et constitué de vivaces et de graminées. Légèreté, sophistication, somptueux et éphémère sont les mots qui signent les créations de ce jeune duo. 
Que le temps soit nuageux ou ensoleillé, c'est un changement perpétuel. Et c'est l'expérience que le spectateur peut apprécier au moment où ça vient. Basically, um, the requirement is the, the 
the, the tree have to withstand 90 miles of wind per hour. And um, uh, so it's, 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 the trunk is quite, um, uh, almost one inch thick of, um, uh, of the wall of, of, of the tree trunk. And then we have to bend all of these um, branches. This is just the, uh, the process. Uh, these are the process shots just to show you the, um, it's, it was quite interesting just working side by side with this uh, company. They have about 40 welders. So um, we were there every day. And then with all done, then they put on these really um, large trucks and then uh, take it to the site. And then we spent another two weeks on site. But at that time, the, the pond was already filled with water. So we have to f create this platform. And pump the water out where the uh, foundation is so that they can install the tree trunk. And then each of the branch, the, the, the larger branches have to be uh, welded on site. Um, in, uh, they, they don't, another challenge is they, don't, they didn't want it too close to the boardwalk. Our idea was to really, um, we know that the sound would be quite uh, amazing to, uh, to hear the rustling leaves. But uh, just for a safety issue, they wanted to be 75 feet out in the water. So finally, we compromised, and, and it was about 50 feet away. So it's really di diminished the size of, of the, the tree. Uh, when it's further away, it looks a little bit smaller. And they used this 170 feet crane to, to be able to uh, uh, install this tree. And it, it was quite interesting just to, just to um, see how, what it would take to, how much effort to, to create a tree, an artificial tree. And that's when we really appreciate, it's almost like when you look at the real tree, it's just quite remarkable when you have to actually, um, took four months to install all of these uh, leaves. And this is the finished uh, installation. Um, what we really hope is that if it was closer to the boardwalk, then people can really uh, see it um, and be standing underneath, but it's quite further out. This one project, uh, we've been doing a series of garden festival. It's, it's really a great uh, venue uh, for us to um, explore because rather than having these ideas, the best place for us to explore is like to have these uh, sketches and, um, and be able to realize it and uh, get, really get to know different materials. And uh, for um, back in 2004, we were invited to participate at the Cornerstone Garden Festival in Sonoma. And for that, uh, there was no specific theme, so we can really, whatever we dream up, if the uh, owner, uh, Chris Hoogie, if he likes the proposal, then we each can create a garden. So they invited 15 designers, and we would happen to be one of them. And for this project, we, were hap we happened to, we were looking, watching the movie Dreams by Kurosawa, there was a, a scene where a visitor to the museum looking at a Van Gogh painting, and then next thing he kind of step inside the painting. And we thought that would be so interesting if we can create an environment where you can actually step in onto the wave. And this was one of the uh, woodblock print by Hoxai of woman divers. So we wanted to create this project and it was a perfect opportunity to take this on the road. And after 25 years, it was my first trip back to Vietnam. So we got the funding to, um, with the support of House and Garden Magazine at that time, we, we were able to go back to Vietnam and spend three months uh, working with Artisan to create this installation.
một thương tóc xòa ngang vai hai thương hai thương răng nhạnh hạt huyền có and we work with uh, 60 villagers to hand it this carpet. And each one is about a square meter wide. Um, then we ship it back to uh, Sonoma. And Xavier spent another month hand sculpted this rolling landform. The idea is to stretch this um, um, carpet over this uh, landform like a um, sweater. And uh, it's really thick. It's made of nylon so that we uh, sew them together on site. And when it's exposed to the sun, it will get softened and very malleable so you can stretch it so that it can fit into all the corners. And uh, we uh, wrap the whole fence. We use what's left of the monofilament to create this uh, invisible fence. So when the light hit it, um, you cannot see through. At the time, you see right through the garden. And it's, it's called the lullaby garden uh, with, the, with the music by uh, Huyen Tan to draw you into this place. So it's almost like you're walking on the waves. And slowly the material disintegrates after a few years and then it faded back into the color of the uh, uh, rolling hill of uh, Northern California. Um, because most of our projects are elsewhere, our state or overseas, so We've been spending quite a lot of time on the plane, and when we look out the window, it's all usually just clouds. So one day we thought, let's make a series of clouds. And um, uh, th th these clouds, they, um, they have no form, no shape. In a way, it's really um, help us sort of like free ourselves uh, from so much of design, but just the making. And, and this series of clouds, um, uh, it started from a private, house in Malibu um, where they have this courtyard and we were asked to create something that provides shade and the idea of this floating cloud uh, that it has um, really uh, uh, there's no shape to it and uh, it's completely contrast with the house which is really rectilinear and uh, very uh, geometric so the idea we we would think of these outdoor rooms and can the cloud stand by itself but can it also be a floating garden and um, 
at night it transforms into a chandelier. And the same thing at Cornerstone. What we want to do is see how uh, light changes with uh, the cloud. So depends on in different area, different location, the cloud will take on a different mood and atmosphere about it. So this one in Cornerstone, and it looked like a stormy cloud. And during my time at, uh, at uh, Harvard GSD for the Love Fellowship, then I met John Beasley, who is the uh, director of Dumbarton Oaks um, for the landscape and um, garden studies. So John asked us if we could uh, create something, an installation for, for that site. And uh, this is what we're going to end this talk. Yes. So this is the cloud.